hi there i'm back again and uh, i hope you enjoyed the other vlogs and um today i want to focus on schooling under lockdown conditions and you know in our uh, first vlog or second vlog we focused on systemic violence and today I want to look at the return of learners under level three as a form of systemic violence. Now I'm hearing you already saying who is education violent? How is education violent? The reality is that under lockdown conditions, we've been told that social distancing is important, sanitization is important, and hygiene is most important now our children need to go back to school according to the south african government according to the minister of basic education but what are the challenges that we are experiencing in them going back so on the 1st of june 2020 the country will move to level three and people will have more freedom, I suppose, under lockdown. I believe that almost 80 million people will be going back to work and government, in terms of the education department, is expecting grade seven and grade 12 to go back to school but this is where systemic violence comes in our schools are not the same in South Africa some schools are well resourced others are not nearly 30 years into our democracy we still have schools that don't have toilets. In fact, a young boy died when he went into a makeshift toilet. He drowned. What parent? What parent wants to live with that with the fact firstly that your child died secondly that it wasn't necessary for your child to die and thirdly that your child died because your child didn't have a proper toilet at school so we had schools where sanitization cannot be practiced on the basis of the kind of toilets they have. And we have a situation now where schools are called to ensure that the premises are sanitized. Yes, and who's doing that? The school community. Now we're expecting those children to go back. How will we practice social distancing? Because in many of our schools, we have 40 
people, 40 students in a classroom. And the number of students in a class is even higher in some of our communities. Now, how do we practice social distancing? So in many of our schools, we have more than one grade seven class and more than one grade 12 class. The education department is asking every, every teacher to come back to school. Now, what does that mean? Because not all teachers teach grade 12 and not all teachers teach grade seven. And when we're talking about high schools, we are also talking about teachers who specialize in certain subjects. So now let's go to the maths class, grade 12 maths. 40 learners in a class. Clearly, the classroom will be too small. They'll have to divide those classes. So their maths teacher cannot be the only maths teacher teaching them. They will need to equip other maths teachers to teach grade 12. So it's not as easy as just making a decision and saying, go back to class. There are logistical issues that prevent that. And I'm not even beginning to talk about the health issue. I'm simply talking to the church, logistical issues. Some people, uh, like Professor um, Jonathan Jansen, and uh, sometimes I'm not a great fan of, of Professor Jansen, but anyway, I agree with him that schools shouldn't be open this year. But under these conditions, where our schools are not the same, we don't have the same resources, like other schools, where we still experience inequality in our schools. We are now expecting those children to go back. Now what have Grade 12 and grade 7 learners been doing all the time during lockdown. And this is our reality. The learners who have come from more fortunate families have been able to do online learning, e-learning. And there's a number of brilliant programs. And this country could have continued with online teaching and learning. But here's the problem. We have not addressed the inequalities, the structural violence in our communities, particularly in our schools. And that is why you can go to Westerford high school and find wonderful toilets, clean, fresh, we don't have that here in our former black and colored schools. In fact, this is the reality. Sometimes children don't go to the toilets because of the state of the toilets and what happens in the toilets. So that's the first problem. 
second problem. Grade 12s must go back. They write an external exam. But 2020 has been a very different year for them. Because some learners who come from advantaged circumstances are able to continue because they have received online teaching. Which the majority of learners in our country, grade 12 learners, have not had the privilege of. And why not? There's no computer at home. There's no data at home. Home is overcrowded. Home is perhaps an informal dwelling, a backyard dwelling, a crowded house. So no, they haven't had access to what many advantaged people have had. No plafty on, now this dog decides she must bark because a motorbike is driving past. We go on. We go on. We won't silence the dog. We believe in freedom. Freedom of expression. So let them express herself in a barking. The point I'm wanting to make is that wanting the, with the department wanting to send our children back to school. The conditions for learning and teaching must exist. But in many of our schools, it does not. Now, Minister is saying some schools are ready to open and others are not. What does it really then mean academically? That some schools will be ready to take their children through examination and some learners will progress to grade 8 and others will be able to, in grade 12, perhaps go and do post-schooling. So technically we're not all the same. Student A and student B have different circumstances. You know, and it takes me back to 1985. Now you Moms and dads my age, you will remember that in 1985, as part of the resistance to apartheid, the students took a decision. High school uh, students as well as the college students. They took a decision not to write exams because of the state of emergency brought about by apartheid. So that was their own choice. How does it differ from the situation here now? There's no choice. People have been told you go back to school. Teachers have been told you go back to school. And parents are left now to make that decision. And I'm aware of a number of parents that have taken the decision not to send their children back. Not necessarily because of the conditions of some schools, because those conditions existed prior to the lockdown. 
their decision is based on the right to life. Yes, the right to life. It's a constitutional right and it's a human right. And it is because the virus can be picked up in these large crowds. Only 50 children, only 50 people can be at a gathering. But at some schools, you have more than 50 metrics, more than 50 grade sevens. So we, we actually non-compliant to the very lockdown rules that government set. They create non-compliance because more than 50 learners will be going back to school tomorrow if they decide to go back. So now you can pick up that it is the system, it is the system that creates the violence. It is violent to send the children back to school, knowing that we have not yet reached the flat curve, the flat line curve, whatever you call it. Knowing that we expect the number of deaths and the number of people who are positive to increase. The other day I was listening, I was watching EMCA. And EMCA raised the issue of schools where principals are aged 60. Now, I want to know what is the department going to do about that? What is the department going to do about vulnerable teachers? Teachers and principals who have chronic illnesses. What are they going to do? Must they now go back to school? Because people who are vulnerable, like myself, the lockdown only ends September, October. So what's going to happen to those principals? Must they go back? Or are they not going to go back? Who will be in their place? Who will not? And sadly, the unions woke up too late. Now, you guys can get angry at me, but as a former unionist, I'm disappointed in you because you're waking up only now to this big, big issue. So don't be quick to blame government solely for the predicament we're in. What did you do to ensure that our schools are safe. What lobbying did you do? What advocacy did you do? Why do we still have schools with no proper toilets? Why? So yes, I am extremely angry. Because we are playing with the lives of our children. And then we expect these children to become our leaders. And this is what our children told us at the People's Commission of Inquiry into Child Safety in the Western Cape. They made it very, very clear to us. You, you people want us to be the future leaders, but what life are you giving us now? How do you expect us to step into those roles when this is our living condition? our learning condition. So this is a systemic violence that springs up from a national disaster, 
a national disaster that now brings up very clearly, unequivocally, the issues of social inequality, of social injustices that we're still dealing with. This is a form of systemic violence. I don't want to go into the discussion of who is responsible for learning. Who is responsible for the education of a child? Is it the parent? Is it government? Is it the school? I've always maintained with my two daughters and the school didn't quite understand me. But as a former curriculum advisor of the Western Cape Education Department, my position was very clear. I'm the parent, I am responsible for this child, and I will make the decisions in the interests of my child. And so I'm hoping that our parents will be wise, will discern over the decision to take the child back to school under these conditions to keep them at home. And as one of the unionists said last um, night, and I think I'm going to end with that, he called on all parents and all schools not to return to school as an act of solidarity. COVID-19 lockdown, one of the learnings, one of the gains, people stood together. We had people from Harfield bringing sandwiches to people of Hanover Park, etc. We're standing together through the lockdown. And I'm hoping that we will do the same in supporting teachers. I am mindful of the fear that not only children will have, but teachers will have, principals will have, supporting staff will have, and parents will have. So I call on the South African nation to rise. We cannot put our children's lives in danger. Make the right decision. Use your human agency to prevent this violent act. This is violence. It is systemic violence coupled to structural violence. It impacts on the health of our children. We can prevent this. It is predictable because the professors out there, the academics out there are all saying the chances of the children picking the virus up is very real. So if your child gets the virus, don't only blame government. Your decision too, as difficult as it is. And lastly, I want to end off by asking, in fact, let me just put it out there. Winston Churchill, great politician, never went to school, ended school at a very young age. So in, under these conditions, can we have an alternative way of learning and teaching?
because this issue raises huge challenges around how we view education. Till the next time, I've now left you with a lot of things to think about. Till next time, I'm signing off as the Director of Violence Prevention Agency and um, this is now blog, vlog number five where we're dealing with the systemic violence within education. And you can find this video on YouTube as well. Take care, make the right and wise decision and now the perfect opportunity to provide your children with an alternative education. I thank you. Till next time. Bye-bye.